Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Haas Talks Foss. I'm the Haas, head of Open Source Strategy here at Procona Matt Yakovitz. And today I am here with Ovais Tariq. Hello, Ovais. Welcome back to the Haas Talks Foss. I'm doing great. Today? Thank you, Matt, for having me here. Uh, the last time I was here, uh, we had a wonderful conversation about, about databases and, uh, you know, uh, how we managing data at Uber and that to be back here and really miss you at the at the conference. I was looking forward to meeting you in person. Oh, yes, I know. Right. So for those who don't know, I got COVID like the the very week before the conference, so I couldn't travel. Um, so it was horrible because you spend all of this time and energy and you want to meet all of your friends and all the people you know in the community. And then it's like, I'm stuck watching on Twitter. <laughs> It's very sad and depressing. So, um, so now I need to go out and do more conferences to make up for it. That's that's my yeah, goal definitely. Now. You definitely uh, have but, to do uh, that. No, uh, but look, I can tell you that the conference was success uh, for me personally. It was great to be back in the community in person, meeting people, and uh, the schedule, the speakers, everything was great. I got to learn a lot, a lot of new things. So it was great to be there. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it, um, you know, because the only one that you could blame for that would be me on the schedule. So I'm happy that the schedule is okay. It's good. Yeah, good speakers, good lineup. That's good. I like that. I like the feedback. So Thank you were there and them. Uh, now, oh, my. Nice. <laughs> I was. I, I, did you see that yes, I photoshopped yes, myself I in yeah. to photos? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's some videos floating around um, that that I just ended up in mysterious places. So I'm just going to say they're they're quite great if you go look at Twitter for those. Um, always always fun. But um, Elias, you mentioned yes, the last time we talked, you were at Uber, and now you're yeah. not. <gasps> you you have your own company now, and your company is called Tigris Tigris Data. What? What is Tigris all about? Tell tell us tell us about what what what, what your aim is with with Tigris. Uh, yeah, uh, would love to would love to do that. Uh, so Tigris, you know, is still connected with my uh, history with databases and uh, uh, based on my experience over the last uh, fifteen years, uh, working at Uber, working at Procona and other companies. So uh, it's about building uh, a user friendly database uh, that makes it more that makes it fundamentally easier to consume and use databases for real-time applications um, and the idea is to uh, move away from an unbundled approach that the industry is going towards towards more of a bundled approach where the developer doesn't have to think about uh, in t uh, taking up multiple database systems putting them stitching them together and in, and imagine things like you know data pipelines uh, and data movement across, across system, different systems. So simplifying all of that and really providing what I think is the right sort of less experience for databases. So it's really you mentioned different databases. So under the hoods, is it handling where data goes to which sort of database, which type of database, and it's routing things? Is that the, the, um, the gist so, of it? You know. Uh, if we think about uh, data access patterns in general and what applications typically end up using, there are a couple of things that, that come up to be common. One is the OLTP system, and there you could be using a SQL database or, or a document database, and then uh, you need real-time search uh, because you want the users of your application to be able to uh, do keyword searches, fuzzy searches, and be able to uh, uh, personalize their, exp their experience that way. And then... Uh, because microservice architecture is so common these days, and that's the way to build scalable applications, even driven development has become very important, which essentially means that um, streaming is very important. That's the way that different services communicate. So these are the three distinct data access patterns that I think are very important for, for every application. And what we are trying to do is cover these three data access patterns. Uh, but not by saying that, you know, there's a single storage engine that's able to serve all of that because that would uh, simply not be possible. But uh, have instead have a single platform that supports this, these type of data access patterns while abstracting away the different storage engines that are used to make it happen. So it's like one engine to rule them all and then behind the scenes you can pick like the, the proper things without the end user having to understand the underlying yeah, so one platform uh to uh, one platform to rule them rule them all uh, in the context of real-time <laughs> applications so the user is interfacing with uh, simple easy to use apis 
And those APIs are backed by a smart query engine, which knows where to, which storage engine under the hood uh, to route the traffic to. And then the platform showing that those data structures, those distinct storage engines are consistent and in sync. Now, you mentioned easy, right? Like, so I'm curious, right? Like, so APIs, that's good for developers, but for DBAs, it's like APIs, isn't that what SQL is? It's just the, that's the API to the database. So why are you focused on easy in the developer experience? Like what, what brought you to focus there? (laughs) Yes. um, Yeah. Easy, um, you know, databases traditionally have been difficult or hard from a usability perspective for developers, um, especially when when I'm writing no. an application. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on who you talk to, right? I mean, if you're talking to DBAs and FIB or my DBA head, then no, databases already provide all that you need, right? You, you just don't know how to use it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if I put on my application, um, application developer hat, then um, it... Uh, it's uh, oftentimes hard, a little hard to reason about data modeling. Oftentimes, it's a little hard to map between how I'm building my application, which tends to be more object focused, uh, and then mapping it back to SQL. I think it tends to be a little harder. That's why we we see things like ORM being used, right? Which is essentially providing a way for the developer to be consistent with how they are writing the application code and accessing the data base in the same way. So that's what I mean by, uh, by by ease of use and simple API is that our focus is for the developer to not have to think outside the code, right? So as you're writing your application code, you use the application code to define your data model, and then you use your favorite programming language and the favorite programming language construct to be to access the access the database. You don't have to think about a separate language. Uh, and, and a different way of, uh, you don't have to think about a separate language or you don't have to think about a different uh, uh, approach to storing and accessing the data. So that, that, that's essentially the approach that we are taking, which means that um, if, for example, you're using Go, uh, you would define your data model using the Go constructs, right? And, uh, and then you will have uh, APIs that are similar to any other function call that you would have, which would you would use to store and access the data in the database. And then behind the scenes, you're doing all of the the scaling, the operational stuff, just handling it all. On, on uh, your yes, um, uh, scaling it, uh, keeping it efficient, uh, making sure it's reliable, handling all of that. Yep. Backups, Backups, all of the operational all stuff, stuff right? right? Yeah, all of the operational stuff. So the, the idea is to keep the infrastructure abstracted as much as possible uh, while providing the right level of observability. So not having it as a black box, but still making sure that all the operation concerns are taken care of. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I, we we joke a little bit about like you know <laughs> developers, you know, like not thinking that databases are horrible and hard to use, but they do. They think that databases are horrible and hard to use. Like, I mean, I, 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 I kid, but you know, I, I, I always tell people. Developers hate databases. Most of them hate them. Like they, it's a necessary evil, and they they want to avoid it if they can. They do it because they have to store data, but they don't want to. Um, that's why you know I think that we're seeing kind of a renaissance on technologies that help developers feel more comfortable interacting with their database layer. Right. So you know having the ability to have the security, the you know availability, everything baked in. That's great. But then also giving them an interface where it's just natural to whatever programming language or um, you know APIs are used to, uh, it just makes sense. Yes, and that that is essentially uh, the route that we are taking as well. You, you you put it really beautifully that you know as much as uh, we as database engineers uh, don't like the fact that application developers don't always love the database. That's that's simply true, right? And that's why um, I think it's important to take a cue from the application framework side uh, there's been a lot of you know interesting stuff that has happened on the application framework side uh, like lambdas and making uh, it more higher level so that developers are thinking more about business logic and not you know having to configure and run web servers i think we need to take a similar approach on the database side or data side in general and you know focus start from the developer experience that you know what is the develop? What, what is the day-to-day tooling that developers are using? They are using some programming language, right? And 
how do I make this seamless for them mm -hmm. to not have them learn something new? Now you're you're doing this as an open source project um, as well as eventually commercial. Um, so you know, what are you, are you looking for code contributions? You're looking for help in that space. You know, like what 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 are you looking for from a community perspective? That our listeners, our audience, how do they get involved? Right, and what 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 sort of help could you? Use? Yes, um, so we are building it as an open source project. I myself am a big uh, open source proponent, and my career has been dependent on you know. Uh, MySQL for the most most part and, uh, and, and other open source technologies. And uh, we are building this, uh, we are building Tigris as an open source solution. And there are multiple reasons for doing that. One of the reasons is, uh, you know, from a transparency perspective, especially when you're building a data and database product, it's important to make sure that um, uh, it's clear that uh, it, it, it's clear to the users in terms of how we're building the database uh, and because that's what's going to store the data, right? So transparency is really important there. Um, then the other aspect of open source is what you touched about, the community aspect, right? And I think that community is really important when you, when you are thinking about building a developer-friendly product. How do you build a developer-friendly product, right? By, by uh, basing the roadmap of the product on feedback of the developers by doing things that are really, that the developers are... Uh, or the users of the product really think that uh, this is making their life easy. And I think that's where um, uh, community comes into the play. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really focused on uh, making sure that our product roadmap is essentially driven through community, right? So that's, that's one core part of it. Um, the other part of it is contributions, which is essentially, which is again, the, you know, the power of open source, uh, which is, uh, yeah, all of these smart people around the world um, getting contributions for them from them would would make the product uh, a lot more uh, robust, right? And that would also make yeah, that, that obviously also, that, yeah. Yeah. power yeah. the crowd. <laughs> yeah, um, and and there's and and that's essentially uh, uh, the the important reasons why we are going with open source um, to. You, to have the community support so that we are making the right product while also have the community support to actually build out the product uh, in the right way. Awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's great, right? I mean, I think that, um, you know, ha having the ability to tap into the community and to work with the community, it, it drives a lot better code. It also drives good feedback. It helps you with your product roadmap. I mean, it, it's, it is kind of the yeah. de facto standard. Now, what's interesting is in the open source space, and I'm not familiar with your uh, plans in the future, but we're seeing a lot more people adopt open source as a means to tap into the community, but then their end product ends up being the as a service model. So, you know, a, cl a cloud-based solution that, you know, hey, this is where we make our money. Sure, you can go grab the code, do whatever, but we have the, the behind the scenes cloud as the deployment method, um, if you will. And we're seeing that more and more with um, a lot of big companies, whether it's in the MySQL space or, um, you know, the... Postgres space, you know, and Mongo space, whatever, where it's almost like cloud first um, with open source being more of that kind of marketing type of uh, thing to get the, you know, interest and galvanize. So I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is that a trend that you've seen as yeah, well? Yeah, I definitely see the that? trend. Uh, I, I definitely see that more and more happening. I definitely see that a trend. And the way I think about it is I, I think that that is essentially using the community to... Uh, for your own gains, but not actually giving back to the community, right? So it's especially if you, you know, mm. you have built out a open source product, and uh, there are different variations of how how these companies are building out the business. They, for example, the deployment code is not open source, right? So yes, the code is there, but how do you actually run it in production? That is not open source, right? So is it is the product really open source then? Then the second part we see is uh, other types of licenses, which essentially, uh, you know, mean that the product becomes open source when it has actually grown old, right? Like, okay, this will become open source after three years, two, three years. Well, you know, after two, three years, there are going to be so much security holes, so many bug fixes. Who is going to actually use your open source product? So I definitely agree that I see this more and more as a, as a marketing ploy and not really contributing to 
you know, giving back to the community and making the community more empowered, which is why the approach that we are taking is that everything is going to be open source. We are doing the development in open source, and that also includes the deployment mechanism. That uh, the deployment pieces, for example, we are uh, we'll be using Kubernetes uh, to uh, to to make it uh, to be able to run the system, and you know everything around that is going to be open source, and uh, we would eventually end up having a hosted version of the product. But the hosted version would no, be no different than what is open. So it would just be, you know, think of it as an installation of the uh, product that is available open source. Uh, so it, this is not to say that the hosted version is not needed. Hosted version is still needed because not everyone would be able to host it. Uh, but I think that uh, like when you're utilizing the community to grow your product and take it forward, in order to give back to the community, you need to make sure that you actually make the open source part usable. You provide it in a way where people can actually use it and run it if they want to. So, you know, it's an interesting thought. So I was, you know, KubeCon was also this week and uh, being at home stuck with COVID, I was, like I said, I watched basically Percona Live through Twitter, which meant I picked up on all the KubeCon things as well. And there was an interesting thread that I started to see throughout some of like the conversations at KubeCon, which was, um, there are the most popular topics are the user topics, not the contribution or the deep kind of like open source topics. And that really got me thinking like, and we've done some surveys here at Percona about this as well. I don't, I, I think like the generation of developers and users isn't necessarily as tied to open source as a must as much as it is a checkbox and they really more care about like the button right like oh look i'm just going to click the button and you say it's open source so i'm just going to trust that it is but i don't really understand uh, underneath the hood or really care and i'm not going to contribute i'm just going to use um, and I think that that's a really weird trend and I don't know how, what to make of it yet, but it, it, you know, getting to kind of like the, you know, Hey, you know, that, the, the different model here and, you know, contributing back to the community. I, I wonder if we've kind of tricked people into like, you know, open source is, is a term and it's a, it's a, it's just another one of those, like, it's like, you know, scalable, it's web scale, right. You know, like, is it turning into something like that now where, you know, yeah, we, we, we all love an open, you know, no open source who've been in the community for a while, but for a lot of folks, do they understand and do they care anymore? That's a, that's a tough question. That's a tough question. I think that on our part, we need to do more education so people understand what, what truly open source means. But I think that the other part to it is essentially the cloud and the impact of the cloud, right? Because uh, more and more people are now used to uh, clicking the button in the cloud just having the solution available to them right With, and not having to run it themselves and that is a completely fine expectation because uh, most of the products don't tend to be infrastructure specific products right and um, and giving the user the ability to not have to worry about infrastructure is important that's uh, that's how you enable people and enable a lot of these developers to move forward with their businesses and their products so that that is definitely one reason why it is this way I I do think that uh, uh, people care a lot about open source uh, and especially over the last few years, we are seeing more and more trend uh, open source being something really important. And when as part of, uh, you know, um, building our product and, and we have been, we have talked to a lot of uh, uh, users of databases, right? And one thing that has always come up is the open source part that, you know, they would very much prefer to have something that's open source. And in some cases, uh, you know, if it's not open source, they wouldn't even consider it, right? Because um, uh, like, like one of the things that you were mentioning that open source, um, there's definitely the transparency aspect and community aspect of open source, but the other aspect of open source is quality. Uh, having a product open source ensures that the product has longevity, the product has, has more quality. And that is something that, uh, that that people see when they uh, you know use uh, an open source product. Well, with this push button kind of environment that we're in now, where it's you know it's all about how do we just make developers 
forget about the infrastructure, right? Um, what are the pain points that developers are facing in the data space now? Like what, what, are, what are you seeing like as the critical issues that keep on popping up? Um, you know, I've got a few that I've seen over and over again, but I'm curious, what are you seeing in the space in terms of, you know, hey, now that we've solved or we've got solutions for high availability or for, you know, um, uptime or, you know, like scaling, you know, a bit, uh, what what sort of pain points do developers care about? Yeah, so from a, uh, from a usability perspective and developer experience perspective, I think the, the biggest pain point for developers is actually related to the unbundled architecture approach um, or unbundled product delivery approach that the industry has taken where instead of the developer having a end-to-end -end solution uh, we provide the developer with lego blocks a lot of options and then we expect them to pick the right option and connect the right lego blocks and connect them in the right way while learning each of these lego boxes individually while operating managing observing these individually and that is the biggest pain point that i see that uh, from an architectural perspective the like the lego based approach or unbuilded approach if i'm building a platform myself like the way i'm like tigress that makes sense because that's the way uh, to build a scalable architecture but when i'm building it from a user perspective the user should not have to worry about many lego blocks and how do I stitch them together and how do I stitch them in the right way? And I think that that is the biggest impediment that I see uh, um, based on my research developers that I'll, I'll seeing these days, that they would very much want to have a end-to-end uh, -end solution uh, that works for them out of the box. Yeah, and a lot of times the database side of things is a secondary thing, right? So there are solutions for, you know, a lot of deployment methodologies and, you know, uh, methods for the application side, the tools in the application, but from the database perspective, yeah. it lags behind a couple of years. So it's a it's a magnitude more difficult uh, to handle a lot of those yeah, issues. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. And that, that, that is exactly where I think that we are trying to innovate that how can we push the database industry forward and, you know, start thinking about it more from a user perspective and not necessarily from our perspective as, yeah. as database developers. So, you know, pushing the database, you know, space forward, there, there's, there's quite a, quite a big <laughs> ecosystem out there. There's a lot of database companies. Um, wh where do you think is the next big thing in the mm -hmm. database space? Like, where do you see like the, the space evolving here? You know, right now, you know, we started to see some new SQL uh, type applications and, uh, you know, databases start to pop up. We've, we're starting to see, you know, the emphasis on the developer. What's the next big thing? I think we will see more and more emphasis uh, on, on developers. Uh, for sure. Uh, and we will see the industry go back in circle. Uh, you remember back in the Oracle days where Oracle was able to handle, you know, there's different type of use cases. We will see more. And that's what I refer to as a bundled approach. Uh, so we'll see the cycle mm. go back there where we'll see more and more of these, you know, unified solutions or uh, that, that, that work out of the box. Uh, so I think that the industry is going over there. And then the uh, the other thing that is important is I think that there's going to be a blurring of line between purely a database versus a backend that can also run some business logic, which you have been so uh, oh. in the database industry would remind you of stored procedures and, and stored functions, right? So I think that we will see more blurring yeah, of yeah, lines yeah. between application frameworks and database, and we'll be moving more towards a backend approach where... Uh, you know, as applications are moving more towards a Lambda style architecture, uh, we would see more and more business logic getting pushed down to the database uh, and we'd be seeing a push more towards a unified solution. That's more on the delivery aspect of thing. And I think that there's other aspect of it as well uh, due, uh, due to, you know, increased focus on data privacy and regulations. The other important aspect I we will see is um, distribute data uh, database is being distributed instead of the centralized approach um, that we saw uh, emerge in the over the last de decade we'll see of more of a decentralized approach and pushing of the data close to the user doing the processing close to the user instead of bringing everything in uh, in a central place.
Yeah. No, it, it's an interesting point that you make that, you know, that there's this technology, technology uh, cyclical, you know, wheel that goes on. And I think most people don't realize that like a lot of technology that we use today was really invented like three iterations ago or four iterations ago, and we just rediscovered it and repackaged it. And a lot of the ideas that we come up with for new things, they've existed before. It's just we're rediscovering, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting space and you can learn a lot from how people have done it in the past. And, uh, I, I constantly see the pendulum swing one way and then people go like, Oh my God, we're so distributed. We're crazy. We've got all these things. Now let's go back and consolidate. And then we get to consolidate and it's like, wh why are we spending all this money on these monolithic yeah. big things? Let's go back and go you know, and distribute again. And so you, you get this back and forth. Um, and I think you're going to continue to see that happen uh, because in the tech space, you know, it, it's just a wheel. You got to wait long enough and eventually it'll come back around into popularity. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. You, you, you do see the circles and uh, in the tech space in general, even if you look at the programming languages, you know, moving from dynamically typed languages to statically typed languages, uh, uh, so th there's definitely, uh, th this is definitely something that we see, but I, I think that whenever a new iteration happens, uh, when we go back in the cycle, um, we do come back in a better way, uh, you know, because technology has generally moved forward. Yeah. So, uh, when we come back, we, we, we come up with a more efficient solution, a solution that will take us forward further. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely see that. It's something that uh, is, is an interesting thing to see. Um, but yeah. So, Ovice, I like to play. Uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't get this opportunity to play this game with me last time that you were here, which um, I like to now, I've started this thing of just asking a lot of rapid fire questions just so people can get to know my guests. Um, it's, it's actually a pretty interesting, fun way to just hear about you and learn a little bit about Ovice. And, uh, you know, so these are 100% random questions off of the top of my head, and I do not know what I'm okay. going to ask. Okay. So I'm just forewarning uh, you. Are you ready? Well, uh, yes. Are you not, ready? But let's say yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Growing up as a child, what was your favorite food? My favorite food was uh, barbecue. Yeah. Barbecue. Okay. 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 Um, you know, and now what is your favorite food? If we're going to take you out to dinner, what kind of restaurant or place are we going to take you? Barbecue. Uh, <laughs> I haven't changed much. Oh, yes. okay. So you, you haven't changed much at all. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. What's your favorite vacation destination? Favorite vacation destination. Um, uh that's an interesting one uh you know uh and there, there are a lot of places in california so uh you know we, we keep visiting it but uh, i definitely i haven't been to mediterranean but that seems to be the place that i would want to go to and probably would be my favorite destination okay all right fair enough fair enough um what was the, the last, last book, book that i read um uh Amp, Amp It Up is the, is the book that I read last. Uh, it's by the Snowflake CEO. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I, oh, I okay. definitely recommend okay. people reading it. It talks a lot about uh, execution and delivery. And, uh, and essentially, execution delivery is what separates you a successful company from one that's not successful. So I highly recommend reading it. Okay. Fair enough. What about your favorite My movie? My favorite movie is... Uh, 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 the Dark Knight series, Batman, the Dark Knight series, uh, not not this one, the one oh, uh, with okay. Christian Bale. Uh, that's that's my favorite. Okay, okay. So, it, was it is it because of the Joker and Heath Ledger, or was it? Just I think like it was the, the whole, whole series. series. Uh, Heath Ledger for sure. Okay, uh, phenomenal, uh, uh, you know, uh, acting. But in general, I just really liked uh, how emotional it was, and it really gets me emotional whenever whenever I watch it. Okay. Uh, well, there, there. Yeah. Maybe you could be the the Dark Knight of the database space, right? So you can, you know, like you can fight for data justice. That'd be cool. I don't know. We could create a comic book character. Somebody out there, create Ovice into a comic book character for us. We would appreciate it. Um, so you know, out of all the the database releases that you have been part of in all the different databases, what has been your favorite database what has been release? My, uh, favorite database release. Uh, yeah, so um, 
of course you know uh, my sequel 8 uh, i think uh, was a leap forward so i uh, I, i think that was a big step forward uh, my rocks uh, you know bringing in uh, rocks db to the my sequel space and uh, uh, then uh, but i think that uh, Uh, the the one that i liked the most was uh, the work that we did at uber building uh, building ubels uh, distributed document database and you know taking that into production and building out a scalable system that that's that was one of my best experiences i would say and finally we'll end with this one what is the absolute dumbest piece of code you've ever seen moved into production like you know like you scratch your head maybe you had to fix it maybe you were going to percona and somebody got called in the middle of the night to fix something maybe it was somewhere else you worked what's like you know something that's so like to even today you're like what how did how did they do that why did they, that's just awful uh, yes well i am uh, i am a perfectionist <laughs> so there are so many examples uh, that i can think of where you know uh, it was um, uh, just so hard for me to to understand how this got into production and i ended up <laughs> rewriting it so yeah hard to come up with a with a single example but yeah i definitely say that lot of lots of such cases and in fact uh, when i look at my code a year later Uh, I see the same thing that how the hell did this go into production? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right. Oh, Vice, thank you for coming out. For those who are interested in Tigris Data, you can go to, is it tigrisdata.com? It's tigrisdata.com or, or tigris.dev if you yep. want a shorter one. And Tigris as in T-I-G-R-I-S. Okay. Okay, and I would encourage you to follow um, Ovice and the team on LinkedIn and Twitter and all of the socials. And uh, thank you for hanging out with us today, telling us a little bit about Tigris and talking to us about the open source. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, coming here again, and thank you so much uh, uh, for setting up this podcast. You know, I've been following it, and uh, it's it's a great great learning experience. So I'm I'm super happy to be here, and uh, looking forward to being here yet again. Oh, great. Yes, and Ovice, you know, I, I think I think you might have seen. I, I ended up being number one in the data, open source database market podcast in Tunisia. So it's you know it's growing in popularity. You know, I have that number one moniker in Tunisia. I'm just I'm I'm, I'm aiming for the number one. In, you will in get the rest there of for the world sure. Now, yeah, so. this is this is definitely one that I follow. I'm, I'm going to really get there. Uh, one, uh, you know, anyone who's listening to really follow this podcast. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Advice. Uh, yeah, really thanks, appreciate man. you hanging out. Cheers. Wow, what a great episode that was. We really appreciate you coming and checking it out. We hope that you love open source as much as we do. If you like this video, go ahead and subscribe to us on the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And of course, tune in to next week's episode. We really appreciate you coming and talking open source with us.